right, well, we got Dan on the line. And I started thinking, I probably shouldn't have shared those pictures. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys, we got Don Higgins on. Um, anything that's got to do with uh, chasing big deer, I've got my hands in it somehow. So. Well, my name's John Eberhardt. The first one that comes to mind was early in my career. I'm Scott Buckley from Iowa. Um, I had jumped him in the summer, too. He jumped up in that swamp grass down in the bottom lake. And, uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm chasing it. There ain't nothing stopping me. Justin Hollinsworth. I'm with Whitetail Addictions and uh, Lone Wolf Custom Gear. So what are we talking about tonight? We're uh, we're talking about the one that got away. They talked about a deer that you didn't get it done on for some reason. Um, So uh, go ahead and get into the story of the one that got away. All right, guys, we are blessed with greatness tonight. Uh, We are talking to the one and only Lone Wolf. How are you doing tonight, man? Hey, I'm doing, man. I'm making it. Yeah, I appreciate it taking some time to talk to some podunks on here um really jack to talk to you about really excited to get you in this series um i don't know if this is something you've ever got to talk about on a podcast or not before but uh just excited to listen to you talk whitetail for half an hour here cool i enjoyed doing it wish i had more time to do it you know yeah i know you're a busy man with a lot of stuff going on and uh but it seems like you're I, uh, I always talk to like Heath and guys like you, and I just hope I have the passion to get out there and still hang and hunt and make moves. And, you know, when, when you get up there in the age a little bit, you're out there making us look, you know, soft. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm, I'm feeling it, brother. I turned 60 last year, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm feeling it. But I think you can rely on some experience, so I don't have to go at it so hard physically. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that definitely plays a role when you can get in there and you be like, all right, this is where I need to be. I know then you ain't got to make the 87 mistakes that we make <laughs> carrying the stand around. And then you walk around for a mile and you're like, there's nowhere I want to set up in here at all. And then you end up back in the track. So <laughs> yeah. that needs to be a goal right. we have Cody is in 30 years, we just rely on the experience. So we're not out there kicking our own ass. Yeah. yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun to kick your own ass, but, uh, um, but you know, years ago when I was younger, uh, did some elk hunting, and it was uh, it was like it was kind of a bow hunting and an athletic deal combined, two passions. And it was um, used to like to work, you know, work out and things of that nature. But uh, now with scent control and all that, I'm real careful and try not to break the sweat and get in easy and um, and getting stealthy and just uh, uh, relying on what I learned over the years, you know. Yeah. That's, that's definitely what it ended up being. You get that much experience, that many kills. Um, just so if anybody's lived under a rock and don't know who you are, give them a brief introduction of who you are and what you do. So, uh, Andre DeQuisto, um, I'm the founder of Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands, Lone Wolf Custom Gear. Um, I have uh, been designing um, and in the tree stand business for around 40 years now. Um, and that's one of my big passions is uh, whitetail hunting. Once I took that up, uh, I started designing and, and making my own products. And because I have no life at all other than whitetail hunting, in the off season, I would take my products and do just what a lot of guys do now, uh, modify them, fix them, uh, improve them for the next season, just basically getting ready a whole year in advance. Um, so now uh, I retired for a while. I did sell uh, lone wolf tree stands and then um, decided to come back out uh, retired out here in uh, in Iowa, and I'm excited about some of the new products we have now and uh, and the innovation. So I get I still get to have my cake and eat it too, I guess. So yeah, you got to step away for a while and focus on just hunting, and then come back in and come back in Second with a win. brand new kick-ass product. That's for sure. So are you there? Yep, I'm here. Still. Oh, okay, right. all right. Um, so the reason we had you on is. We wanted to talk to the absolute best uh, in the business, as we like to say, at killing deer. Um, and we thank you that you are way up there, uh, not only killing deer, killing like world class deer. And uh, we, you know, you come on podcasts and you talk whitetail, but you don't ever get to talk about the one that got away. So, what is the story of one that a deer that you just hunted and just could never put the pieces together on? So. Oh. It's, it's funny that uh, I never like to have um, 
uh, input on what we're going to talk about on a podcast. I like to just come in cold, you know, ask questions. I don't like to think about it. And this time you put me on the spot to think about it. And I, oh, yeah. for the life of me, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm thinking back. I mean, there's a lot of deer that I haven't got, um, but not a lot of them have gotten away. <laughs> uh, there's one that I've been hunting particularly now. It's, it's a pretty big, uh, a decent deer, but just, um, um, and it's just a matter of not being on the property for all that amount of time, just showing up for a, like a week, a year. So it's that type of thing where you're limited to, um, your hands are tied to, to going and getting it, you know? So, um, I have had the pleasure of, uh, and I thought I would talk about those literally hunting, uh, two different bucks that would have been, um, net and world record typical, um, status and and did not get him obviously um but i keep thinking back and i think back all these other deer that i hunted and i didn't get um and i swear to god i there was there's probably nothing that i would do different um i'm pretty much set in my ways i know um i know what i know and i'm very confident when i do and i don't ever really second guess um a decision it's the right decision and to me, it's fate that just didn't, you know, the chips didn't fall my way. So, um, you know, you can't control what a deer does that. And, I, you know, guys talk about luck. Uh, the only luck I believe in is bad luck. Um, and I'm not a real lucky guy. So if a deer could come down a trail and, you know, make a turn to come to you or make a turn to go away, you know, 99% of the time, I think he's going to he's gonna go the other way. Cause I, just, I just don't have that luck. So over the years, I just kind of... Uh, got it in my head and my father was the same way. And he taught me early on, uh, you aren't going to get any breaks. Um, you're not going to have the luck that a lot of guys get. So what you do is you work twice as hard and you make your own luck. And I, and I've had that, uh, mindset in business and in life and everything. Um, uh, in the same way, white tail deer, you know, um, I think I'd hunt them all the same way. Like I said, it's, uh, but to, to, to be in a game with a with an animal of that caliber, um, here's a perfect example. So me and a buddy of mine, I shot a buck in Wisconsin one year that missed the state record by about an inch in the soul. Found some sheds the year before, and uh, a good friend of mine, um, we both were checking, you know, the old school trail cameras, and we were at a Walgreens, and we, we put her in, and there that buck was. We, a picture showed up. And we both looked at each other like, you know, our jaws dropped and holy shit, you know, game on. And while he's, you know, there in a panic and what, 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 what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to that swamp and killing that buck. <laughs> and it's like, you know, he didn't have a clue. He didn't have a plan. I already know, you know, I went, tore my equipment down, made sure everything was quiet, you know, tightened everything up and just, and just got, got into the game. It's just another animal, um, even though it was a bigger class deer. Um, I go at them the same way. They're all, you know, some deer have a little different um, personality than others, but um, I read sign. I believe what my eyes see and I hunt accordingly and I don't, I don't second guess it, you know? Um, and if a deer, here's another thing that uh, if, if I set up on a spot that is just red hot, I almost know hundred percent I'm killing the deer that I'm after. And if the deer doesn't show, I've never, ever second guessed that I made the wrong decision. I just know that something happened. The deer just didn't get up because the moon phase. He's probably still sitting back in there. Somebody else bumped him. Something happened that threw it off the sign I read because um, I just believe it should have happened the way it did. And if it, like I said, it didn't show, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's anything of my fault. It's just um, sometimes they don't, you know. Yeah, sometimes I'm a little long-winded, so you guys slow me down anytime you want. And... Oh yeah, so, so everybody <laughs> says they got that sixth sense, and I believe you. If, if you, we have sets like that, like the one set uh, last year, early season, we went into. Man, we just felt like it was perfect. We were gonna kill for sure, and the mm-hmm. it's crazy when you go in like that. How quiet you are, you're slow, and uh, with you going in like that every time. It's just making you that much more successful because you're every time you're going in like this is exactly where I need to be. You're 100 percent confident. You're not thinking about somewhere else. We catch ourselves doing that a lot. We're thinking about, man, we should have went over here. We should have done that. 
um, wonder what this is like over there. But if you know you're in the right spot of where you need to be, it's going to make you that much, you know, better being quiet, taking right. time, getting set up. Um, the, the only not- time, the only time I second guess myself on a stand is if I don't look around first. If I don't have, even though the spot's great, it's been great in the past. There's a stand put in the right tree there. The wind's right and everything. And if I just jump in that stand and hunt it, uh, I just don't do that much anymore. I'll still want to go look at that spot and look at the sign. I cannot get in the tree, and it just freaking bugs the shit. I'm telling you, my binoculars look around on the ground, or, um, man, is that ice cold down there? Am I wasting a night? I just I can't do that anymore. So um, my hunting, more or less, in these last years has been um, the day of uh, or the day after. I mean, I'm just constantly on. Uh, red hot sign and on the deer and if you if you put yourself in that spot in that tree uh, so let's say you put yourself in a tree this year uh, where there's a, a Pope and young coming down a trail uh, one or two times if I put myself on a trail the entire year every time there's a Pope and young in that trail I mean the percentages and the numbers are just so much in your favor you're gonna um, you're gonna capitalize on it and uh, try and beat beat fate or the odds per se so um hunt like, hunt like a wolf man <laughs> yeah confidence that's, that's the motto. you gotta go in there and if you go in there like you do every time that's something we need to work on more i believe is just going in there like okay this is where we need to be all the pieces are right we're going in here and we're killing a deer and i feel like in, once you get more time in the woods and when you feel like you're you have the the intel that will make you successful and with you you know going in and scouting before you're hunting we've been doing that more and more every year we right. don't have an idea where we're going but we're we're definitely i'll tell you it's, it's uh you can be you can be 40 yards off the mother load just on the other side of a ridge or down at the opposite draw and where there's just chaos ensuing over on the other side and you're in a you're in an ice cold spot or something it's just um, it can be that that close. Um, difference between just you know the most awesome shit of your life and, and not seeing shit. So um, I always tell a story about uh, we hunted a property here with me and my son, and uh, you know one year early in October, every buck on the entire property was in a draw. There was a doe they thought was going in the heat early there, and they were on her ass, and and there was not a buck anywhere else on the thing. It was it was just loading up. Um, and if you weren't over in that draw, <laughs> you you're just hunting, you're seeing some does, and you're you're just wasting your time. So, and I do not very impatient um, hunter. I do not uh, I do not sit all day. I don't like to waste my time. I um, you know the old adage: surgically removing something from the face of the earth is to know it, read it so good that you just I mean you just you set up just everything right and and a good. Uh, a good show to watch would be Heath this year. Um, he's becoming quite the killer, and so is uh, um, Justin. They've, these guys have really come as a, into their own in the last five years, where they are just hunting machines, man. They don't, you know, they go make their own luck. They don't wait around for shit to happen. They go, they go make it happen. So, yeah, aggressive. We, yeah. You got to get a little more aggressive. Don't worry about cracking a few eggs, you know. Yeah, we've definitely been following both of them and. Uh, that's I keep telling him that's who I want to be when I grow up. I want to be like he's just out there, just still <laughs> crushing it. But so you had mentioned the uh, the deer that was one inch from the state record that you had hunted, and yep. uh, go ahead. You said you might talk about that. So I'm I'm intrigued on that. Go ahead and let us let's hear that story. So that deer was a um, uh, I almost killed it. I mean, within got a couple more steps, I probably would have put an arrow at the year before. Um, you end up finding the sheds. I'm not a big shed hunter, but we did. I just end up luckily finding those sheds, and it was in the right around 172 or something, I think, like that. Um, but the the property I have is an absolute shithole. It's a uh, tamarack swamp. You know, you knee high boots, you need in there, it's all wet, marshy, uh, low bog stuff. Um, and that deer was, was living in there, and um. There's the deer. I got all my shit together. I got all my equipment. Now we're filming for a show. So you got extra, you got camera, you got extra arm and back kind of stuff wasn't as light as it was now. 
And I went in there two days and I thought, you know, it's just fucking busting my ass. There's just no fucking way this is happening. Um, so I decided to back out, um, figure out where that deer was, and then just, just hunt him as he, he comes out of the swamp onto the dry ground and uh, changed up my tactics, you know. Um, and it worked. Um, I jumped him out of his bed off of a point, and uh, I knew he was in there. Um, and the deer just did the same thing it did the, the year before when it started running does during the rut. Come out on my property. I got some dry ground there too, and we were just running that circuit. My uh, my brother was seeing them all last year. Um, do the same thing. So um, made the right move. I don't know. I mean, I might have still tied into him back in the back in the shit or in the suck. I call it. It's um, uh, but that one had to be a little bit more of a patient deal where I'm normally pretty aggressive at going at him. Um, a lot of guys think too that I just dive right in on embedding areas and go to it. I always, if, if you if you got that piece of the puzzle, if you know where he beds, you can kill him. That's that's my motto. And if you have that piece of intel, I always try and let him have that little bit and then get him coming in and out of there. Sometimes I won't even go and hunt a deer on a morning spot because I have him pinned down and he's coming to a crop field or whatever. Uh, but when them son of a bitches don't want to freaking you know cooperate. Uh, if they want to hang back in there and play that game, then I just, uh, and I'm dying to, for that to happen. I roll the gloves up and I go in and get them. So um, it's uh, it's a little more aggressive than most guys, you know, um, taste, like but that. what I've I learned like over the years, you know. You're, you know, you're letting the deer tell you how to hunt it. Don't go in there thinking you could crush him right on his bed. If he's playing the edge and you could play a little safe and kill him, you're just letting the deer tell you. This yeah, well, you, you got it. I mean, you got the, well, what are, but another buck that, uh, I, uh, the first buck I killed, um, in Wisconsin, uh, early, that one, the state record by same thing, a couple inches. Um, that deer, uh, I was watching two weeks before the season had him patterned and there was no way I was going to dive in there on the morning. I had him freaking pinned out coming through, working the licking branch with a batch of group of bucks. Uh, I slid in there and, and shot him on the opening, opening evening. You know, there's no sense even try and mess with him on the morning. I had him just pinned down. So, um, but I do love getting, getting right in there and then mixing it up with them. Um, many a times I'll be hunting. I'll actually, there'll be that buck will be bedded within 50 yards of my stand. I can hear him chewing his cud and coughing back in there. Um, and I'm right up on these deer and I get up, I hunt on them and I get out of there. They don't even have a clue I'm there. So, um, be able to yeah, do that's that. something that we've never heard before until last year where we were really pressing into some beds and we heard something and we were like, what is that? And then we were like, that's gotta be something coughing. And lo and behold, it was a buck over there bedded coughing. And we had just set up 60, 70 yards from him. And he got up and rubbed a few trees and looped around. And then he had worked off and we did a light rattling sequence and he came right back to us. And we were like, he just wasn't, wasn't big enough to shoot, you know? And right really cool but um we had hunted yeah, they, off of some sign they, and then we scouted it and if we would have scouted it before we hunted like you said i think we would have been more in the money than right in the spot yeah. yeah yeah oh i pushed it dude i pushed it to the limit i've got many times we've taken it one step too far but that's how you kind of learn um you can see where it's gearing down where it's getting hotter and hotter you just got to know where it almost stopped there then and and and, and make your set um, you know, uh, one more step and all of a sudden you look to the left and there's the buck bedded looking you right in your freaking eye. Um, sometimes you just, you know, you get, you just get too close. So, um, yeah. Tommy, do you think that night that we came in on the South side, if we would have went another 50, 60 yards and set up, we would have had more success? Um, not per se, because we did see a buck. We just didn't see the right buck because that buck did come and work that scrape right there. I think only, you know, that spot can only hold maybe one mature buck there, um, at any given point, but, um, it, it wouldn't have hurt. I don't think anything is as good as we got in there. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's, we, we can hunt the North side of this spot and the South side with the wind, but like I was talking to you before, there's just bucks right now that are just being silly and doing the same thing like 12 minutes apart in the daylight, coming out the same trail right out of his bed, 
I got a tree picked out already. It's like textbook surgically actually removing a deer. And that might be the first so, time we could ever do it. And they, we got like 16 days. He's got to hold true for another Okay, so I was, I was just going to, I don't want to re- interrupt you, but I'm laughing because I was just going to do a poll. So I just had a, I just put a little pond in here. I'm going to, I put a couple ponds in to try um, uh, some new stuff hunting off of. Um, but I went and I found a licking branch. Uh, we're a bachelor groups working the whole shit coming out. The uh, acorns are dropping in there right now. And they're coming out through beans, which are still a little green, so they're still eating tops off them. But I was going to put a post out. Anybody that saw this spot would be pissing their pants and thinking, this is going to be it for opener. That whole scenario, I mean, to set a stand up right there right now would be ridiculous to me because them acorns will be either gone or rotten by that time. So that window closes. Uh, they'll be breaking up in hard horn uh, here pretty soon. So that licking branch will be busting up. And the beans are right now turning and they're, they're not hitting it. So that here, that's a spot that I've seen here today. If I had a, I could set up that stand right there and guarantee you a hundred percent. I could kill a buck out of it today. 16 days from now. I don't think so. So not that I'm going to leave the, you know, leave it for dead. Those deer are obviously going to move up and change up. They'll be still in there. Uh, but that particular spot, and that's how it is through the whole season. As the seasons change, as the deers change and as pre-rut comes in and they, and, they, and they do what they do, all that stuff is a constant moving, blowing um, monster to deal with. And you, and you just can't park it, man. you got to stay, stay on reading it, what you're doing when the crops change. You know, um, Not knowing that, years ago we had to do, um, like I told you about, I sat two weeks before a season the last thing big old open marsh cattails watching. We don't have to do that shit anymore. We got electric devices that can do that for us. Yeah. And that's great intel. Um, and then during the season, it's, you know, I still utilize them um, in a little different way. I never go in anymore and really check cameras heavily. I have a bunch of cameras in and around the property that if I'm in that area hunting and then something develops there, and on the way out, I'll grab a card and see just what was there. I mean, we did that with uh, Justin's buck this year. Um, pulled a card and had his uh, his deer where we seen him slipping around that woodlot on that trail, um, which verified what we already read and knew. Um, but it's uh, it's great intel. Um, but don't let it be a crutch. I have a lot of guys I know that because they ain't seen them on their cameras or they're um, not getting them. They're not moving. Like right now, you know, the cameras go dead on minerals and all that. The deer start moving into the it, it, things change up. Uh, the most important thing is to get get your lead on what you want. That that's what that tool is um, is there for. And then you got uh, it's game on, right? You're not guessing. How how often are you seeing a buck change up his tendencies from year to year? Are you seeing you know? F- every other buck stay about the same and every other buck change up year to year or are more deer staying consistent year after year? Like we hear uh, people say, you know, he was here October 27th and he was here the next year, October 28th, you know, within that 36 hour time frame. Yeah, is that so something you're seeing? I've, I've experienced that too, which is pretty, pretty spooky on that. But what changes up most of a uh, whitetail's uh, deal is uh, these crop rotations change food and, and I still go back to, I don't care what anybody says about you know the rut hunters or late season hunters food 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 rules the rules the world the white tail's world and it, and everything revolves around that so um, as that changes up they change up um, and even there in the rut it all still kind of revolves around that so um, that part of it's going to be changing up but maybe that deer showing up on a property, at a certain time, uh, I've seen that happen before. It might be coincidence. Um, you know, we don't have the big rut movement that a lot of places have. We don't get a lot of strange deer that come in running through here just because of the way our uh, property lays in that. But um, um, and I've never been much of a rut hunter. I'm more of some more geared to looking for one one animal and chasing them chasing them around. So. I know we were talking to Justin, and he was when you, he was hunting with you, 
he was saying you guys were all over the property checking here checking there and he was like man we need to get in a stand you know pretty much and and you were like well let's not get in a stand he said you said let's not get in a stand until we know it's the right one you know and, well we were running out of time for the last the last day you know, I, I told me we looked at it, it was a great tree, it was a great spot, the sign was decent, and I said it's you know we can get in that that stand, we'll probably see some bucks here in that. But I had a line on a, a deer that I seen come out of a draw earlier in the week, and I checked that draw two times, and it was cold. I said, let's just you know, I'm not in a big hurry to really need to harvest the deer. It'd be nice to have another one, you know, two down with you being here this week for our show and stuff, but. So we went, we just, we kept going. We, we didn't have a lot of time left, but man, we just ran right into the frickin' mother load, just big old polished fresh rubs that just happened the day before and just red hot up into the draw that I knew that, that big guy was hanging in. And uh, that's what you look for. And we only needed an hour and a half to kill that deer on that spot. We needed three hours to find it and then uh, just an hour and a half to kill it. So, um and a lot of guys do it the other way. They just spend, you know, if you jump in a tree and you sit there long enough, you're, you're going to see some deer. There's going to be something coming by there during that rut. But um, if you go and you're sitting on that, that hot sign every time you're in, you're going to be on too. Um, it's amazing how many, I'll, every time I'll, I'll sit in a newsstand, I could kill a buck just about every time on there. Set it up. Now, what's wrong about that is you're burning up time on animals that you don't, no, and the same with scrape hunting. Um, if I have tried to pin on a big deer in a scrape on this property, if you've seen the scrapes that are the amount of bucks that are around, the amount of scrapes on there, it's like a needle in a haystack. So you use your cameras to locate the ones that the big deer are on, and those are scrapes you hunt. If you go in and blind hunt scrapes, good luck trying to find your 170. Uh, that's an impossible task. There's just too many of them, you know. So. Um, Pin your shit down, man. Get precise on it, and, um, and know the animal you want. And uh, you know you're looking for big sign, not smaller, and then and just you, you get good. To, and all I gotta say is, the more you do it, uh, the more sign you read, the more you see the results, um, the more you'll learn. You know. Yeah, last year we went in. It was perfect October cold front coming in. We looped up in this public land, did a big circle, and we were gonna set up somewhere. Didn't like the sign went deeper didn't like the sign went deeper and it was getting late like it was mm-hmm. we probably had like what only like an hour and 40 minutes left to hunt maybe yeah and by the time and, i got back and there. i was like all right this is it i like this <laughs> and uh we set up and uh a mid 150s 160 class buck was a, a guy was actually 60 yards from us set up that we had no idea was there and he uh-huh. killed that buck but that oh, deer was coming right to our, our way. And <laughs> homie, we, we well, filmed too, and homie got him, that guy shooting that buck. And that oh, buck shit. Went down. Yeah, yeah, we put, we posted it on our Facebook. The guy shot him right in the butt, right in the side of the ass cheek. And, oh, uh, shit. The deer Take died the 40, yards, yeah, 40 yards from our stand. It was insane, wow. but we were going in there, and that guy, we didn't know he was there. He was set up in a stand that was already back there that someone had put up and he was facing away from us well he's seen us come in and he's thinking these guys are coming in hella late i ain't gonna see anything you know they're yeah. setting up and then lo and behold that buck still showed up e- even though we were you know late and we, we yeah but we that hour and a half was mad because we didn't have camo on i'm like dude i go in in a t-shirt we yeah. didn't carry stuff i go in in a t-shirt and then put the stuff on but yep. stuff don't have to be textbook if you're in the right spot. Like you, you no, just you just you, you, yeah, you're hunting. So yeah, that hour and a half is uh, worth you know another 24 hours of just jumping in and sitting on a mediocre shit spot. You just it doesn't make any sense to do that. You're just wasting. Uh, and I'm a guy who's got a lot of time, but when I didn't, time is of the essence and, and precious, man. You can't be burning up um, or having. And I got into a bad habit here too because there's not a lot of deer that i want to tell them i want to kill and i still hunt every day because i enjoy it i like to film and do some stuff um but you can um you can get complacent with a lot of that stuff too and just um um i don't know it's, it's kind of hard to explain it's it's uh you're better off to 
to look around and, and screw up a few spots than you are to sit a shitload of them uh, where you didn't mess anything up and you just never had a chance or never had a prayer or anything. So, um, yeah, I call those, I got guys, I got guys. Shit sets. We got to eliminate those. We got to eliminate the bullshit sets out where you just hunt. Yeah. You're mm-hmm. just out there to be out there, you know, just jumping, just let's get out there and jump in a tree. Well, yeah. wow. Um, might as well just sit on the porch with the bone. Uh, yeah. Hope this yeah. Bite, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, that's I mean, actually we, a bad joke around here. Cause there's some pretty big bucks that come by this porch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're kind of back in the woods there, right? You're set up, but yeah, that's, that's something we tried to do last year and something we're going to try to do even better this year is just have a purpose of why we're going in there and not just say, Hell, I can hunt. I'm just going to go get in a tree. Like every, every hunt, we got kids and we're husbands and we work a lot. The time is limited. So every yeah. hunt has to be, there has to be a reason that you're sitting there. So yeah. otherwise you're, like I said, you're, you don't, you're burning up valuable time, valuable days. Um, um, but no, it's uh, still appealing, but it is really nice when there's something out there that you want to, you want to go after that just makes it super special. So, um, yeah, there's something cool. about picking a, picking a deer out, and me and homie both kind of have deer that we pick out, and yeah, uh, you know, it's just there's something about them. If you can beat them, that's the one you want to beat. I mean, a lot of a lot of times we've been trying to kill this one that homie's obsessed with called Westside. He's he goes down every year, and, and last year he might have been 125. Well, it's right. an old, older buck. Yeah, super old. He was probably 160 when we found him, and then he was 155, and then he was like 125, 135 last year. Is he a bully? No, he's a loner. He's a loner, always by himself. No. We have a we have trail cam video of him. How long was that trail cam video of him, homie, that he was just standing in the same spot eating a bush? It was 33 minutes (laughs) of him standing there, and he moved about two and a half feet. (laughs) Yeah, well, a, lot, a lot of the bigger, a lot of bigger older bucks are smart like that. They know they, they don't run into anywhere. They they walk off. They don't. Yeah. They're just cautious. And I was just telling somebody about that the other day. If uh, people don't realize that more of this is more than scent, it's it's these deer are watchers. These big mature animals. And I've had deer come out and then just sense something will be up and stop these huge bucks. And not move a frickin' flex of muscle on your body for 20 frickin' minutes straight and just stare your way. And you just crumble. You can't sit still for 20 minutes if you tried. And there's this animal. It's just not a eye moving, nothing like a statue. How the hell do you beat something like that looking your direction? You know, it's, it's tough. Yeah. So, um. yeah, last year the deer I killed was probably a three year old. And if he would have been a four year old, me and homie are both like, no way we'd have killed that deer. Because he looked at us for three minutes. And he knew we were there. Jake knew that we were there. And then he was just like, I'm going to turn broadside at 20. I'm like, what are you doing? I don't, I don't think this guy can shoot. I'm going to give him his yeah, shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, I, this guy does not look like he can make this shot. I'm going to go risk it. I really want to go this way. But, yeah, if it would have been an older deer, that deer would have been like, no. He would have backpedaled out of there and been gone. But this deer is like, all right, yeah, I joke. <laughs> I joke around with some guys and said the safest spot in the woods is on it right underneath your freaking tree. Yeah. <laughs> my, my my brother used to miss some pretty easy shots too and shit and like um just taking my head like, Wow. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 a great game, man. It's uh um, it's a new game with all this technology and all the the stuff that's out there now. So I'm still not a big map guy and all that, so uh, I might actually get a a uh, one of those um it was amazing. So Justin comes out here. He's hunting a property he's never seen before. He can call up Cody and get these pins dropped to him. This son of a bitch can find my stand in the dark easier than I can. He just <laughs> right to the base of the trees with this fucking new, new technology and shit out there. So it's, uh, like I said, it's a changing game. I'll have to get with the times. Yeah, it used to be, all right, there's the stump, there's the rock, yeah. take the right, yeah. go, you know. <laughs> Now you look at people's phones, they got 87 pins dropped. They know exactly where. I, I don't know how people 
find all their if they run a bunch of trail cameras without pins, I'd be lost as hell. Yeah, well, that's funny because now uh, I get a little old up there. I used to not forget a track, every little piece of sign that you know your mind's fresher, younger, and now it's like I got all these cameras on. Like where the hell is you know? It's almost like you got to be driving that way and all of a sudden remember that there's one. Over, there's so many out there that you could just. Uh, should I? Yes. I find them shed hunting that are left on the trees that forgot where they're you know. But I do have a camera company, so um, I can't have some some numbers out there. <laughs> yeah, that helps out. So got some spares in the closet. Well, I'll, I'll put a. I'll put a camera on, like I'll be doing it again this year, just to learn shit. So I'll put cameras on uh, what I call these, uh, almost like a community rubs, the ones that I get opened every year on pretty big trees, um, and a lot of different bucks will rub them. And I like to, I'll put those on there and leave them all year and just watch what happens on those. Um, from the first time they start hitting them to through the season, it's kind of interesting to, to learn stuff that way where you, you know, this is private ground. You don't have to worry about some someone ripping it off. But uh, I had a camera out last year that literally an entire year, and I seen uh, a buck, um, and the battery lasted that whole time because there was a lot, a lot of pictures being taken. I was just on a trail in, in our bottoms, and that deer, I, I got him in velvet. I got him, you know, growing his rack. I got him through the season, working scrapes. Uh, I got when he dropped his antlers. The whole life cycle of that buck. Coming through that draw on our main property is pretty interesting to see um, that you have a deer that would live, you know, pretty much through the whole season, right? And and it's a, a big pinch point, so they they have to come on through there. Um, but you learn stuff by by seeing that mm-hmm. and putting all that, you know, where you wouldn't have. Yeah, those community rubs is not something that a lot of people find and run cams on. A lot of people just do them on scrapes, but. That's how we knew if the the 190 that I we ended up killing five years ago. Mm-hmm. That's how we knew if he was on the property or not. He would go to that community rub every year and hit that rub and rip her open. Yeah, and you would you would go back there and there'd be nothing, and then it would be like a light switch, and it was yep. the most fun you've ever seen in your life, you know. And yeah, uh, but what was crazy is if a guy walked in there. He would just think that it was dynamite set up. And what did we have? One deer on in daylight there and a whole year, homie? Yep, yep. One in shooting light. Yep. One in yeah, shooting light. Yeah, imagine that, eh? That's a, um, that's a wasted shit, you know. I mean, if it's uh, at the wrong time, it's capture. That's all I got to do is capture that one moment in time, you know. It's all it takes yeah. one, but um, you can burn up a lot of time, waste a lot of time, or you could. Uh, Go with intel and uh, and make a educated um, ambush. Yeah, a certain for, people, you know. for trail cams, I mean, when I was hunting, if I would have seen all that, I would have been sitting up there multiple times. Yeah, like, when you, homie, you would have just you would. There's no way you could have not been in there. Yeah, and a, like, a couple times. And years would... before we knew anything about moon phase and all that too. I don't know if you experienced that, but back in the uh, this is probably before even we were hunting in that, but. We'd all have these spots that were just smoking red hot, beat to shit trails, fresh shit up and down. Just, you want to piss your pants sitting there. And you'd sit those stands numerous days and not see a freaking deer on them. And you just could not believe that there wasn't a deer on them. Well, you know, two hours after dark, there was. They were running up and down that trail, feeding, pissing, going out. You know, it just, it wasn't the time to be on it. Um, so, you know, that has a lot to do with that, too. Uh, midday or if they're moving after dark or, um, you know, and then weather is the other big one. I mean, You mentioned weather. Weather, to me, is the biggest uh, movement of a, a big whitetail uh, that you got over moon phase, over everything, over rut that uh, they just that high pressure, cold, new fronts coming through, man, they just, happy to be alive and up and, and moving and, and doing all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, you weather, speed, wind, yeah. weather, all that stuff. That's, that's what makes the magic happen is yeah. those, that weather, man. Well, just look at, just look at a rut in a warm, hot year. How, you know, it's, it's just laid back shitty. A lot of shit happened after dark. And then just look at when you got a nice cold, crisp, good, good, uh, good weather pattern going through and just, it's the difference between, you know, 
day and night, you know. It's, yeah, it's uh, night and day. We experienced that last year. I know you probably had a lot of hot weather even where you were at last year during the run. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was tragic. We took 18 days off uh, and hunted every day, and, man, it was it was bad. Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. Yeah. It was nice. It's nice when it, it's nice when they're moving though in daylight hours in that weather, huh? Nice easy oh, yeah. jet, nice light jacket. Yeah, you it's 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 beautiful. The mornings were decent and it was you know definitely weren't yeah. wasn't cold. Definitely was not cold ever. Yeah. But then right Yeah, now, the big thing is too cold uh, the, the front came in. <laughs> the big thing that shuts them off and on is um whatever the average is. Uh, and I, I think you could find that out through your, your all your apps and shit like that. If your average temperatures are running at a certain uh, amount normally at that time of year, and you're running 10 degrees hotter or 10 degrees lower, uh, that's that's your big your big window. I mean, Illinois, I hunted one year opening week. It literally was down to 30 degrees on opening day, believe it or not, there in October, and it was like full bore, frickin' battling rut and chaos everything was going nuts you know cause just because of that weather um uh it was so much colder than what when the average is and then just the opposite if it's really hot it could just shut that shit down and you got a half hour window in the morning um to get something done you know everything else moving yeah moving later just moving slow you know Getting back to uh, one second, Cody. I got one question yeah, asked. When you got the wolf on the line, you got to throw it all at him here. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that Cody and I really noticed um, hunting these bigger, mature deer, and just like Cody had said, West Side there is kind of a loner. But um, even when we see pictures of you know really world class whitetails being killed, um, they're they're never really broke up or anything as far as their rack goes. Everything seems to be intact for the most part. Um, so kind of two parts is that something that you're seeing um throughout your hunting career is you know the really big mature bucks are not really broke up and two is why do you think that if they are well, let me think about that so um, it would have to do probably with um so you got your pecking order of deer um in an area you got your bachelor group you might have six bucks and then Maybe four properties over, there's a bachelor group of six bucks. Um, let's say the two dominant of those two deer end up crossing paths. There's a battle to the death right there. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas all the other bucks on this property know who the big kingpin is. And they might do some sparring with them, but they're not going to challenge them. It's not going to be that you know, battle to the death. So there's going to be some times not getting broke up. I think it's got a lot to do with structure the the animals too, as far as uh, what age class if they're spindlier. We had a buck on here one year that uh, literally uh, over 20 different bucks were completely, and I'm talking 140 class deer, 150 all the way up to 170 inch bucks, were missing half their whole racks, all their tines just sheared off, and this was a tank of a 174 inch low tined heavy white tail with a freaking attitude. Um, and if you got anywhere near close to it, there was nothing on your, your head that was going to survive that, <laughs> that impact. So, um, it's got to do with attitude. There are some big, huge trophy bucks that are just little bitches. They're not kingpins. They're timid animals that, that aren't real, uh, real aggressive. So your busted up deer, I think are going to be your ones just coming into your own and at three and a half range, they think they're hot shit and they're going to fight everything that's out. And, um, and, you know, and try and get some action from a bigger one, and they're going to get they're going to get busted up, and the bigger ones um, are not. So there could be, like I said, a lot of things that go into that. Uh, but your real true trophies for me, all of my really big bucks, most of them are four and a half year old animals. Um, if they got any older than that, they would probably start getting stickers and non typical shit, so they they lose their cleanness for their score. Mm -hmm. um, and for a white tail to live in the woods over four and a half years old is a pretty big feat in itself. Um, whether you're suburban hunting and it's cars and vehicles or just a amount of hunting pressure, um, everywhere you turn, someone's flinging an arrow at you. Um, and then just out of nature fighting each other too. It's, uh, uh, the mortality rate of those animals is just is huge. So 
Um, I don't know if that shows any any enlightenment to it, but um, yeah, I don't I don't really have a lot of really big animals that have big shit sheared off. They're all pretty clean, uh, intact. Yeah, what what we've noticed around here is when you get those really big, like the 170 and betters that we've been hunting, they aren't missing a kicker. Like, yeah, who's gonna base who's gonna jag with them? Right? Yeah, I mean, I don't, and and I tried snort wheezing at those deer and stuff, and every time it is not work. And we've asked multiple people about it, and uh, they almost run away from the snort wheeze. And you would think, man, this is the most dominant, biggest deer in the pecking order out here. He ought to be pissed, but. Um, well, if you get him, if you get him in that stage, the right stage of that deer, um, he will, he'll, he'll, he'll get, you know, but if he's thinking about what's going on and some of them, uh, deer are pretty comfortable. And one of the biggest bucks I've ever hunted didn't leave any rubs, uh, scrapes, not a lot of aggressive. Um, uh, and it was like a 250 non-typical. So, um, Jeez. who's going to jag with, with that set of gear? But I, I tell you, I'm in Illinois though, and I have seen some really huge bucks with some really big shit missing too. So they've run into something even who knows what's running up and down that sag the river down there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, the deer that I told you about that, uh, the only deer, uh, fight that he probably ever got his ass kicked on was, um, and I know because I seen, uh, there was a doe in heat. Both those deer were, were, uh, squaring off in a field at uh, dark. It was the night before gun season. Uh, so I left them there at dark, and in the morning I was patrolling my property, so I was up at, at sunup to see, uh, to blast the property. And that big deer was uh, uh, not there. It was the, uh, there was a 12, probably the 170s, 12 frame. Uh, he was in that field with that doe yet, so he beat the other one, but an entire half of his rack was gone. Oh, man. And it was out in that field somewhere, but that buck, you know, it cost him that half to, to get that doe. And it was probably the only deer I've ever seen that that big one. I mean, we had uh, shit, uh, 150 inches sheared at the pedestal by that buck. <laughs> so, Damn. Um, yeah. And again, you know, he might walk up to another deer, and deer are social. They might, you know, how they'll square off a little bit. Their hair will come up on there. If you touch noses and give a little shot, I bet this thing would come up in more of a passive way and then when a deer come up on him he just let that freaking massive rack just just go 100 percent on him and just smash the shit on him. i would love to see that on video yeah <laughs> them times just shearing off there like they're <laughs> you know, like they were corn stalks that's insane oh and that was a big animal too dude big big animal yeah so, that definitely helps and i know we never we never killed that deer but we found it dead uh, during mushroom season so we have his uh his rack up in the barn here, so nice. That's cool. As a, a tyrant. <laughs> well, we don't want to take up much more of your time. Uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and talking whitetail with us. Um, just again, just huge respect for what you've done for the hunting community and for podcasts coming on. Everyone you come on, um, you're a wealth of knowledge. I know you're busy as hell, but for guys like us that are just really trying to learn and absorb any content we can. I really appreciate you taking time on on shows and and putting it out there so people can hear you speak. 